historian and adjunct professor of history at Charleston Southern University in Charleston, South Carolina. You know, I was fortunate enough to have been born and grown up in a very magical time. You see, when I was a little boy in the late 60s and early 1970s, it was a golden age of blacks and cartoons. You see, there was this guy, uh, Maury Turner, shown right here who did a cartoon called uh, The Wee Pals. It was about an integrated group of friends. And he was encouraged by Charles Scholes, the guy who did the Charlie Brown cartoons. And it eventually became a television cartoon called Kid Power in 1972, when I was eight years old, that I enjoyed thoroughly. You also had, in 1969, when I was five, the Josie and the Pussycats comic books, which uh, Valerie is a girl who played in this, is this black girl who played in this rock band along with her, Friends, Josie and Melody, and that became a television cartoon in 1970. And before that, there was this uh, Hardy Boys cartoon that featured a young black man by the name of Peach Jones. He was believed to be the first major black character in Saturday morning cartoons. And along with that, of course, there was the legendary Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids that uh, came out of Bill Cosby's comedy routines about his childhood in Philadelphia. And even for a while, Flip Wilson had his own little set of cartoons called the Clearo Wilson cartoons based on his youth in Jersey City. And to me, the one that made the biggest impression was the Jackson 5 cartoons in 1971 when I was seven years old. And those cartoons showed the Michael and his brothers, the Jackson 5, they were going on these adventures around the world and they were famous and all these interesting things would happen to them. And that made me want to grow up and hopefully do something, become famous and have all these adventures and all that. You see, folks, these cartoons taught me as a young child growing up in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, that it was okay to dream, that it was okay to have ambitions and desire to see myself having all these adventures. And that was a luxury that was afforded to very few generations of the African American experience in America. But I want to pay tribute to the guy that started all of that. There was a man in Philadelphia in the 1940s by the name of Oren Cromwell Evans. That's him right here. He was a newspaper reporter for uh, even the white daily newspaper in Philadelphia, as a matter of fact, during this time period. And he came across this idea. He told Time Magazine in a, feature, in a story on uh, July the 14th, 1947, he thought long and hard about a, co a pl complaint frequently heard among his people, that Negroes are usually ridiculed and their way of life distorted in comics drawn by white men. And because in those days, the cartoons featured of black people were grossly stereotyped. So he, so he and his brother George and several other artists came up with this. Negro Digest, excuse me, all Negro comics in, uh, it was sold for 15 cents. In, 19, in July 1947 issue, all Negro comics. And it's a very fascinating comic book. I managed to get it off Amazon, as a matter of fact. Very rare, too, I might add. And among other things, it featured the adventures of a black detective some 25 years before John Shaft, a guy by the name of Ace Harlem. And he solved crimes and saved pretty women in Philadelphia. And his opponents, incidentally, were a couple of, get this, two vicious young hepcats new to crime. <laughs> Imagine that. And along with that, you also had a, a little fantasy strip for the younger children called the Do Dillies. These were a group of black angelic children and the associated fantasies. Then there was the there, then there was also the first black superhero, a guy called Lion Man. And he had a little Zulu child along with him who was sort of his Robin, or sort of Robin to his Batman, 
by the na by the name of Bubba. That's little uh, Bubba that you see right over here, along with Lion Man. And Lion Man was also designed, incidentally, to give people a sense of pride in their African heritage, as well as giving them a superhero that they could identify with. Now, they also had a lot of good comedy in this book, too. There was a comedy team in here called uh, Sugarfoot and Snake Oil. It was the adventures of two hobos out on the run and the adventures they had when they would hitchhike to various places. Pretty funny stuff. And the adventures of a head peck husband called Little Eggy. That, in a comical way, was dominated by his wife. And at the end of this first, uh, this first copy of Negro, uh, All Negro Comics, it showed Ace Harlem pointing to the young people who were reading this book and saying this message. Remember, crime doesn't pay, kids. Stick to the church and use up your energy in good, clean sports. Be sure to follow the picture story and color of Negro trailblazers and champions in the sports world, beginning in this next issue of All Negro Comics. Unfortunately, the next issue of All Negro Comics was not meant to be. He tried very hard to raise money and get distribution for the comic book outside of the African American neighborhoods around Philadelphia and the East Coast and all that. But unfortunately, he did not get the assistance that was necessary to do that. But he continued to live a very productive life. Or, see, you see, see, Orrin Cromwell Evans went on to write for various newspapers in Chester, and Phil Chester, Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia. And in 1971, he was awarded by the NAACP for his contributions, shortly before his death that year at the age of 69. And many years later, in 2001, he was awarded for his uh, late contributions by a black comics organization and in 2014 the overall comics organization uh, gave him the Will Eisner Award uh, you know in depth for his accomplishments in this field so if you want so a good way to inspire young people with a if you feel that there's a lack of uh, positive things to for them to inspire them you know go online and get yourself the only get yourself the copy of all Negro comics. And you think about it, had this comic book been allowed to survive and thrive, imagine what it could, how it could have inspired many generations of young people and what those young people could have accomplished. Get it for the young people and try to inspire them some more. This is Damon Fordham.